Mo I know a lot of people leave these on the pews, and when Tina has to clean, you know, she has to pick them up and throw them away. So if we continue a lesson, try to keep it in your Bible or somewhere for next week. Right now, I, I gave my last copy to John, and I just have this. But um, if you want, I can make more copies. But we're actually going to be in. Oh, no, no, no. Hold on. Let me see something. Do you have your copy, Cheryl? Here. All right, let's begin in prayer. Donna, would you please lead us in prayer? Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. This is the Lord's day. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. All right, um, we're continuing, as I said, from uh, last week, um, and I'm, I, we're on page three, if whoever does still have the leaflet, page three, we're going to finish reading these verses, and then we're going to go into the book of Esther. It's a beautiful book, a uh, beautiful book, and um, the reason we're actually talking about these verses, the topic has been for the past uh, two, three weeks, three weeks, uh, boldness, courage, and that's what we need right now. And we need to stand up for what's right. Uh, we've spoken about a little bit, we touched upon Daniel, but um, mainly, mainly we spoke about David and, and, and Goliath. That's who we mainly spoke about. And now, uh, after we read these verses, we're going to speak on Esther. Once again, just for the last time, um, whenever I don't finish the lesson, keep it. Don't leave it on the pew because when uh, Tina cleans, she, you know, rightfully so because you want everything to be neat. So keep it in your books, and I don't have any more copies. I have actually made like 50, but they're all gone just about. All right, let's go down to uh, page 3, Ezekiel uh, chapter 3, verse 9. And it says, as an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, the, the, the Lord's words, okay, to the prophet. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks. And I'll pause there later to talk about that. Though they be a rebellious house. Rebellious, I looked that word up, you know, you all know, menacing, threatening. Re no, rebe rebellious is going against authority, but when it says, be not dismayed at their looks, have you ever seen, and you can, you, you can just turn on TV right now, uh, and y'all probably know what uh, TV stations, and see angry people, I mean people that, the, you know, at, politi at the po politicians, they are so angry, and you look at their faces, and you see um, the looks that they give you are about looks that could kill and, and, and um, the Lord speaking here in Ezekiel, don't be, don't be dismayed. Don't be discouraged by their looks, how they look. Yes. Yes, John. What, what, excuse me? Exactly, because they lost. And so now, but there's a demonic spirit right now of rebellion, retaliation, violence, hatred, uh, sedition, treason. I mean, it goes really high up there. And so uh, we need to remember people that are our enemies, you know, a lot of times they're demonically inspired, and you can tell by their faces when they begin to yell at you or say threatening things. God says, don't be, uh, don't be dismayed. Don't be discouraged by the looks they give you, you know, because God has his hand on you. And then, um, let's see here, Ezekiel 2, verse 6, the verse right under, and it says, and thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Do you notice how many times that these verses I've been reading, it says, do not be afraid? Because the enemy, one of his greatest tactics is fear. He wants to put fear in our hearts. What happens when we have fear for whatever of certain people? Oh, they're going to antagonize us, or they're threatening me if I do the wrong thing. When we are under fear... It paralyzes us. 
And so God is wanting to let us know. But the opposite of fear is, is faith. And God is wanting to let us know, I'm with you. Do not fear. So in the remaining verses, just kind of, uh, well, I've been, most of the verses that I've been reading even last week were the word afraid, do not fear. And so there may be a few more, but this one that right here, it says, uh, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. When I bold, the, uh, when I bold in the words, that means I want to bring special attention to them. They're not they're not emboldened in the Bible. I'm the one that's bringing special attention to them. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. You know what a scorpion is, right? I've never been bitten by one. I've heard it's horrific. Um, my mother was from Mexico. She's now in heaven uh, in her rest in her mansion. But um, they have scorpions in Mexico, and she said those things were horrific. You know, they heard, you all know, have heard, they heard a lot. And, and, and here God is saying, don't be scared about the scorpions, people that would come to attack you, you know, those people. Don't be, don't be afraid. It says, for the third time now, the word afraid, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks. Once again, the preceding verse is Ezekiel 3.9, says the same thing. Do not be afraid of their looks. No matter what their faces tell you, you see the hatred, you see the anger. Don't be afraid, though they be a rebellious house. Okay, the next verse, 2 Timothy 1, 7. And this is a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, encouragement, a verse of encouragement. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If we walk with the Lord, if we're in prayer, and we are reading his word, it is less likely that we will be afraid and taken over by fear. Why? Because God's word encourages us. It comforts us. And no matter what situation we face, God will give us power. Where? By the Holy Spirit. And actually, I mentioned before, boldness comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. And we'll read a verse later that is just really Explain it, really, it tells you like it is right there. And it says, but God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Do you know that a person that truly seeks the Lord? Now, there are physical mental illnesses. For sure, we all know that. But so many people are not right in the mind. Why? Because they're not following the Lord. And he deludes them or deceives them. And they take on the same characteristics as if somebody who has a mental problem because they have let themselves be taken over by the spirit of delusion. When we receive Jesus Christ as our savior, he begins to change us from the inside out. And as we read the word, we receive truth. And as we receive truth, the errors that we have believed, the, law, the, the erroneous thinking, uh, thinking that is not right, according to God's word, leaves us. And, and guess what? We will have a sound mind, a sound mind to think as God thinks. And uh, then Mark, the following verse, Mark 5, chapter 5, verse 36. As soon as, God, as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. That's what I said. The opposite of fear is belief. Faith. Okay, the next verse. John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the, wor in the world ye shall have tribulation. Tribulation is like trials, um, problems. In, you'll have, God is telling you, you're going to have problems. But be of good cheer. In other words, be encouraged. I have overcome the world. And... I put here in parentheses, this is my own thinking. I said, if Jesus Christ has overcome the world, dot, 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 we too have overcome the world because we're in him. We too are overcomers. And the Bible says, I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loved me. The following verse, Acts chapter 5, verse 29, <coughs> excuse me, says, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than, than men. I mean, and, and I just put in, this is my own 
per, you know, whenever anything's a parenthesis, you know, th those are my thoughts. The question is, what is our conviction? <laughs> dot, 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 that God has put there. Um, many times we're intimidated by people around us who tell us, well, do this, they, um, they, uh, what's the word? They intimidate us into doing wrong things many times and we end up doing uh, sinning because we're obeying people rather than God. We need to be strong. We need to be courageous, just like David was when he stood up to Goliath, just like Esther, wow, just like um, Daniel and so many other uh, characters in the Bible, other people. Okay, and then uh, verse, Acts chapter four, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. This is, what, this is one of the, the, the main things, the main thing I, I want to come across in, uh, as I, I've been teaching on this subject the past three weeks and today again. It, the consequence of being filled with the Holy Ghost, with the Holy Spirit, is that we acquire boldness. The Holy Spirit gives us that boldness. And no matter what the situation, whether it's boldness or courage, it's the same thing, courage to speak up uh, for him, for the Lord, whether it's to witness to somebody, whether it's to um, reprimand somebody or to speak truth, you know? And I, we, we need to ask the Lord daily, God, forgive me, just a daily repentance for those things that are blocking our communion with God. Bring them to God. Confess your sins before God. And then ask the Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Empty me of self and fill me with your Holy Spirit. He will guide you. I'm sure that those that have been Christians um, for quite a few years will see and know what I'm talking about, that you have evidenced in your life that as you are walking with God, sometimes you think, wow, did I just say that? Did I just actually say those words? And God is the one that helps put those words in your mouth. You don't even, you, you, you need to just say, God, fill my mouth with your words. And you'll be surprised the wisdom that he gives you to be able to relate truth to different people. Um, so that's very important for us to know that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, he will give us boldness and boldness to witness and to do many other things. Because once we are saved, there's such a joy in us and we see what God has done and how he's changing us and the gift of eternal life that he has given us. We want to tell others. I remember when I got saved, um, I've mentioned this before, I was in Paris, you know, and, and it was, a, it, obviously, I, I lived there three months, but I was just, um, I don't remember, just less than a month there. I went through the, the, the whole New Testament, and I don't, I don't know how many, two, three weeks, I spent hours reading it, and I read pretty fast, and I was so impressed, and even though I didn't know the people, and they were, um, how can I say, I don't want to put a whole nation down, but um, they weren't very friendly to Americans. There's, a, there's an animosity there, and but, you know, the Lord just gave me such a desire to go out in the streets and witness to people, you know? And this is, you know, I hadn't really been speaking French as in conversation. I had learned it all seven years, mainly, you know, through books. And very little converse, hardly any conversation. But I, I, and I was reading a French Bible as well. But in all of this, the Lord gave me the words to be able to communicate to people. And that's really more than anything how I, um, at that time, you know, was much more fluent in, in, fr in French and was able to communicate the gospel message. Uh, and then, let's see here, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Ghost. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit in us that helps us to do his work. If we trust in our flesh, and trust me, I have many times, we fail. 
because we can't do things on our own. We have to come to, to the Lord and say, God, I cannot do this. You, gotta, you have to help me. Give me the wisdom. Give me the know-how. Give me the direction. Give me the guidance. I mean, so many perplexities in life. It's like trying to find a job, you know? Like, oh, Lord, I don't know where to turn. And God begins to open doors as we pray. And as we pray for guidance, I've seen this so many times in people, even here in our congregation, God will open doors and shut doors. It's not only finding a job, it's the, the, the daily decisions of life. So many that we have. I mean, it could be something like a, a, a being a mother saying, you know, what uh, daycare center am I going to put my child in? Or who, who do you want me to, to uh, commit you know, the life of my child to? You know, to take care of, babysit, or whatever it is. And th those are huge decisions. As you pray, God will give you that guidance. He will manifest himself to you. And that's a blessing. Especially you, Donna, with f uh, five kids and all that, all the decisions. Oh, yeah. Wow. Praise God. <laughs> You're a saint. <laughs> then there's Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 37. And uh, this is beautiful right here. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? This is almost not sarcasm, but it's saying, in, in effect, trying to shake us up to say, you know what, what are we going to say? If God is for you, who can be against you? Meaning to say, God is going to be with you, and even though there are others against you, he will bring you through. Remember what I said when, um, when we discussed David and Goliath, that David said, the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. And that's how we should always be thinking, you know? The battle doesn't really belong to us. He uses us, and of course, we're going to fight that battle, but we commit ourselves to God. He gives us the anointing, the encouragement. He gives us the power. He gives us the strength. He gives us the wisdom. He gives us the guidance. Uh, you know, to do his will. And then it says in verse 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I mean, talk about, you know, being in a position of need or want, and we all are at different times in our lives for whatever things. God tests our faith. And He's saying here, he, God, freely gives us all things, all things that we need. Sometimes we think we may need something, right? But we really don't need it. It's more a want than a need. But God says he will supply all our need according to his riches in glory. We can have that confidence, that faith. Verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? We are God's elect, his chosen ones. And it says, who is going to bring something against you? Like, meaning to say, God is judged. You know, if somebody brings something against, well, let's continue. It is God that justify it. In other words, he's the judge. Verse 34, who is he that condemn it? In other words, who's good? You know, lots of people condemn, try to condemn us. The devil, that's, he makes that uh, one of his pastimes to bring us into condemnation where we start um, doubting ourselves, you know, doubting our decisions. He wants to make us fearful of making a, a mistake. But you know what? Here God, it, it, the Bible is telling us, who's going to accuse you, in other words, any, lay anything to the charge of God? Who's going to accuse you or who's going to condemn you? Like, I am the judge. God is saying, he's the judge. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Did you all know that even as we speak right now, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God? Now, don't ask me to explain the Trinity, Father, <laughs> Son, and Holy Spirit, because I can't. You just believe it. Believe it. Know that there are three. The Bible says it. So we believe it, the three per, pe uh, persons in, in one, the Trinity, the Godhead. And Jesus Christ stands at the right hand of the Father, and when the devil, and he will, Satan will access uh, heaven, 
to accuse, the Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren. When he accuses us, do you know that Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is our advocate? That's our lawyer. Our lawyer. He defends us. So whatever the enemy may say, you know, you know the one thing that I've heard so much preachers say, you know, not that, that we by the blood because the blood of Jesus Christ covers us covers our sins they're covered by the blood that's why we don't want to trample on the blood of Jesus Christ and when we sin and when God is trying to get our attention to stop and we persist we are literally as if to say trampling as if the blood of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross we're like trampling right on the blood. And so, you know, we need to know he's defending us. He is our defender. And then it says here, it is, wait, let me see. No, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Listen to this. This is so encouraging. Shall tribulation, in other words, shall testings and problems, or distress, sorrow, in other words, or persecution, when people are persecuting us, coming after us, or famine, meaning to say, is any of this going to separate us from the love of God? The answer is an automatic no. It's a rhetoric, rhetorical question. Or nakedness, or peril, or sword. We hear of so many missionaries in North Korea, China, um, the Muslim countries that are being, oh, and the, the new, Brunson, Branson or Brunson, Brunson in Turkey. I mean, they have been persecuted so much and tortured. Now that he's under house arrest, praise God for that. But um, we're praying that he gets free completely and go com uh, joins his family. Uh, he's American. But, you know, so many, so many. And you know what? He says he doesn't, he doesn't care. He wants to glorify God. And this is a rhetorical question. Is this going to separate us from the love of God? And then it says, verse 36, as it is written... For thy sake we are killed all the day long. You know what? Isn't that something? There are people that are suffering so much that literally they're being killed in the sense of, you know, tor tortured and even dying, physical death. Even, even. Uh, we are counted, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Literally, the Bible says Jesus Christ is our shepherd. We are sheep. A sheep is docile, supposed to be docile, and, and follow the master. Um, have you ever seen sheep? They fat them, fatten them up before the slaughter, before they're, you know, killed. And um, we are a sheep because around us, the world, as time goes on, there is more, more hate for the Christians. There is more hate. And this is why I wanted to bring this lesson uh, across to you all as we see the day approaching and the times that we are living in, we need to, to have courage and holy boldness to stand up for what's right. And I tell you what, prayer is so important. It's so important. It's so important. Glenn uh, leads the prayer. Uh, Glenn Dawson on Fridays. So important that we begin to join as a family of God, a church family, and pray one for another and encourage one another. And in prayer, whether it be on your own or corporately as a group, it is so encouraging when you, when you hear others that are in the midst of you know, prayer praying with others. But it is so important that we pray because as we pray, God begins is answering. We may not see the answers, you know, but they will come. And you may be praying a lot of things, and you one day you'll say, Wow, look what God did today. Look how he answered prayer. I mean, amazingly, the power of prayer is incredible. You can access the hand of God that moves the world. You can do that in every situation of life. Verse 37, nay, that means no. In all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. Remember when I said that we are more than victorious. We are winners. You know how <laughs> President Trump says, um, 
we're going to get tired of winning. We're winning, winning, winning. Well, you know what? As Christians, we should have that attitude. You know, we are winners. We're victorious. We're more than conquerors. No matter what the world tells us and no matter how we're tossed to and fro like a boat, sometimes we shipwreck and we think we're like, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of ourselves where, and, and God is waiting to come in. God, is, many times we give up just at the moment that God is getting ready to answer our prayers. You know, we need to be persevering in prayer. That means fervent, making an effort to just continue, don't give up, press on. Uh, and I've, I've read this other verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I'll read it really fast. This is, oh, this is a powerful verse. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer, that means allow you, permit you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And you know what? We need to pray, God, help me to take that way of escape. Help me. When the temptations come in, sometimes they flood, come in. We should be praying already. When they get so hard, Lord, help me to make the decision. He will make a way of escape. He will make it. The, the, the question is whether we will take it or will, whether we will allow the enemy to have victory. And so we need to pray. Pray fervently. God, help me to escape this. Take the way of escape. He will answer your prayers. The more that we uh, follow what's wrong, the more that the lust, which is an evil desire, for it grows. And, and I'll just give a simple, um, and this is uh, just a simple, very, very simpleton <laughs> um, example. When I was young, my, my, my mother, um, for dessert, we would get a candy bar every day, a candy bar, whether it's Hershey's, that was one of the most popular, Three Musketeers, Almond Joy, I don't remember all, all of them, but Snickers, and, um, and, and, and um, Peanuts M&Ms, that was my favorite. And uh, so growing up, we had such a craving for chocolate, such a craving. And when I was in college, if I had any money at all, I would go and buy peanut M&Ms. And unfortunately, when I got my job, you know, when I started working, rather, I wouldn't just get one bag. I would get two bags. And that's such a bad thing to do, you know, because it wasn't just here and there. I mean, I would, begin, I would do it, you know, pretty often, pretty often. And I knew, I said, boy, how can I stop this? And you know, I, re I saw that the more often I got it, the more that I wanted it. Here's the thing, when I made a decision, a firm decision to stop eating that uh, candy bar, the peanut M&Ms, God began to give me, uh, and I was praying, he gave me uh, 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 the willpower, he gave me the power to just say no. And guess what started happening? I didn't even want the other bag, the first one, much less the second one. And now, not, I'm, I like sweets, but I, God has taken a, the huge desire for chocolate and sweets away. I'd rather have food than sweets. But it's just like anything in life. I'm just taking food, something that's very simple, so you guys can know. You know, the more you have something that you're not supposed to have, the more you crave it. Your body. And um, when we say no, God helps us in those decisions. That's a very simpleton example, but that's just uh, something to, to uh, share with you. And then um, if you go to the last page, page 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. In other words, once again, persevere, watch. We have to be continually watching. In other words, how? spiritually vigilant. In other words, around us, you know, what, what, you know, in situations where you feel confused, like what is happening, pray and ask God to show you what, it, what is going on. You know, there's a spiritual warfare always, and there are forces, the evil forces of Satan are always continually coming in clash with, uh, with, with God's will. 
And so we need to ask the Lord to open our eyes, show us truth, and have our eyes, as we say, wide open, spiritually speaking, that we won't fall into Satan's uh, traps. Because he is right there. And then Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles. That's the trickery, the trickery, the schemes, in other words, of the devil. He has many. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high, mm, I think I made a mistake, in high places, I guess, in the evil day. I, I missed something there. And then it's, there, I missed a few words, but it says, in high places, withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, uh, verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod, Covered, covered about with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. This is a mouthful. I mean, I'm not even going to go into this because we've had studies before uh, where we've covered this, and uh, Pastor Dave has talked about this. But the Bible likens um, the spiritual warfare that we are in with being, you know, prepared for the battle with the armor of God. And they, sh they actually have six pieces, and the, the last one is prayer, seven pieces. I most people just say six, it's seven pieces, praying always. Prayer is definitely a weapon against the enemy. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. In other words, don't be scared. Once again, don't be afraid, terrified by your adversaries. That means your enemies, those that are coming against you, which is to them an evident token of term, uh, perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. So in other words, don't be scared. You know, they're going to be in perdition, in hell. You have salvation under God through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. I'm not even going to mention, this last verse was mainly written for the Jews, so I'm not even going to mention that verse. But I put here, these are my words right here, and I've said it before, and I'm going to read it again. The times are here now, and more than ever, quickly approaching, approaching where we will be required to stand up for the Lord and be counted. We will need to have the courage and holy boldness given to us by the Holy Spirit to proclaim his word and to be steadfast in our walk with him, to be stable. We will be tested like never before. Here the Lord is telling us not to worry what we are going to say or speak. This was mainly for the Jewish people, but I take it for myself too. Uh, for he will put in our very mouths the words he wants us to say. And this is what I was saying before. The Holy Spirit himself will speak through us. And so um, this was a leaflet, four pages. Now, I said I was going to start... Uh, probably Esther, and I'm just going to give a few, a few pointers for Esther, and we'll do the book of Esther next week. It's a beautiful book. Uh, Esther was uh, an orphan girl, and she was, no she was known uh, as the heroine for the Jewish people. And um, just like we have Queen Candace in our church, there you go, uh, we, no, Queen Esther Queen Esther was a heroine. It's a beautiful story of, um, of how the Lord used her to save her people. And what did she do? She put her life on the line. She put her life on the line. I mean, she, you know, she, she, 
And I said this before, and we'll go into it more next week. You know, when, when, you, went be, when you appeared before the king, no matter if you, she was queen. Yeah, I mean, if you appeared before him, guess what? If he did not um, point his scepter towards you, you were dead. So she risked her life, but she had firm conviction. More than anything, she had faith in God. And she had fasted three days and three nights with her maidens, with her maidens. The power of fasting is tremendous. And because of that, I mean, the things that she did, it, it, it's a powerful, powerful um, passage, uh, chapters, the whole thing. And you know what is interesting? The book of Esther is the only book in the Bible that does not mention the name of God. But you see the Lord written all over the book. And here's a, something interesting. You know, Really, there are no coincidences, if you think about this. A lot of people say, oh, what a coincidence. You know, it may seem like it, but something along the way. And the more that we commit, and we're not robots, by the way. We're not robots. But the more that a person commits their, their lives to the Lord, the more that you give permission for God to uh, uh, orchestrate or coordinate different events. And even for people that are not following the Lord, but that know him, Jonah, he ended up in the uh, uh, bellies, the whale's belly. And here, um, who would have thought that Mordecai was going to be, for those that already know about Esther, but we will take that verse by verse, he happened to be at the right place at the right time, in the court right there in the, in the gates, where he heard evil people conspiring to kill the king. God, that was, the Lord orchestrated that, so that later he would gain favor with the king for s helping save the king's life. And so many thing, other things, there are so many other situations in the book of Esther where you see God's hand completely in the way the, the events happen. And the great favor that God extended to Esther, where she, like I said, she, ended, she was an orphan girl, and she ended up actually being Queen Esther. So we will talk about that next week. She was Jewish, by the way, a Jewish girl. And um, it's a beautiful book, so we will discuss that. So for now, I just want to encourage you all to um, allow the Lord, and it's a challenge to me, to have his perfect will and way in our lives and pray that he takes over every area of our lives. You know, so, so many times we want to keep certain areas of our lives to ourselves, you know. But God wants, God is saying, I want to touch every single area of your lives Commit them to me. I am faithful. God said, who is he that condemns you? I mean, nobody's bigger than God. Nobody. And God is judge. He's a righteous judge. So we can commit ourselves to him, and God will do great things for us in our lives if we commit our lives to him. And ask him to daily examine us. Daily and to get rid of those things that are not pleasing to him. Repentance is so important. Not, you know, we talk about repentance and revival. You know what? Repentance begins with each of us. And it's an everyday thing where we come to God every day and say, God, sorry for, I, I, please forgive me for my attitude. God, please forgive me for the harsh words I said. Father, please forgive me for my selfishness. Lord, forgive me for my greed. Oh, Father God, forgive me for my temper. God, forgive me. And if we have problems with rage, forgive me for rage, road rage, whatever. Whatever it is, we need to ask the Lord daily to, to examine us and get rid of those things. And as we do, God will begin to purify us. The Bible says sanctify us, cleanse us. And he can begin to fill our lives, our hearts with the Holy Spirit in such a measure that he will be able to use us and that we can be able to fulfill his plan for our lives. And really, one of the greatest prayers is, God, help. I pray, Lord Jesus, that m your will be done in my life, that you can accomplish in me the purpose that you have for me. And we all have a plan and a purpose. It doesn't matter who you are. God has a plan for everyone's life, everyone's life. So that makes us special. We are his children. He loves us, and he has a plan for us. Let's pray. 
Dear Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your uh, provision, God. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for so many blessings that you give to us daily that we take for granted. Help us to have grateful hearts, Lord. Use us for your honor and glory. Help us to be bold and courageous, full of the Holy Spirit, God. And help us to fulfill your will for our lives. Thank you, Father. I pray for the remainder, for the next service, Lord. I pray that you would have your perfect will and way in every heart. I pray for the salvation of souls, the conviction of the Holy Spirit upon our lives, that you might be glorified. I pray, Lord, for the testimonies that will be given today. Oh, Father, that you might be glorified. We love you. And for the baptisms, that each person that comes to get baptized will realize that they're, they're taking a step of obedience, Lord, as a testimony to everyone that they are following you, Lord. Oh, God, bless each and every person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.